Okay, thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Kirk Leach, and I put on this session, uh, Africa and Oil. So welcome to the discussion. Oil is a way of capturing the imagination. Oil is often invoked as a machine of destiny. Oil will make us rich, oil will make us poor, oil will bring war, oil will bring peace, oil will define our world. And in the discussion about climate change, often oil is blamed as something which will help destroy our world. As Nigeria reaches its 50th year of independence, I think it's an apt time to discuss the role of oil in Nigeria's past, but more importantly, I think, the role oil may have in Nigeria's future. Just to put the discussion in a bit of context, I've got a few statistics just to throw out which might help you frame the discussion. Nigeria has earned over $400 billion from oil in the recent decade, yet 9 out of 10 Nigerians live on less than $2 a day. Per capita income, that's national income of, uh, per person, may have a few weaknesses in defining the wealth of a country, but per capita income for Nigerians of the GDP is one-fifth of South Africa. Senegal, which exports uh, fish and nuts, has a larger per capita income than its individuals in that country produce more wealth than actually Nigeria itself. The World Bank estimates that 80% of the wealth of Nigeria has gone to 1% of the country. So in Nigeria, millions of people still remain in poverty. But how much is this the fault of the oil companies? And equally, are oil companies such as Shell responsible for resolving these problems in Nigeria? Have they caused the problem, or is it a Nigerian government problem? To help us answer some of these questions and raise others, we've brought together an interesting panel. And they will speak in the order I'm going to introduce them. Um, here on my left is Dara Akala. He's a senior program manager for the Living Earth Foundation, which promotes sustainable community development in Nigeria. On my right here is Joseph Croft, who's executive director of Stakeholder Democracy Network. And they work to empower those people uh, living in countries which are dominated by the extractive industries, such as oil and uh, natural, other natural resources. Over here is Barnaby Briggs, who's a strategic relations manager for Shell, with a particular focus on Nigeria. And the speaker who isn't yet to arrive is Dippo Salamanu, who is the CEO for Atriba Limited and a journalist for Africa Confidential. So first of all, Dara. Talking about Nigeria, I mean, for those of us who are quite familiar with the place, Nigeria is an exciting and amazing country with its abundant uh, natural resources and uh, the highly enterprising and uh, intelligent human resources. It's got all that it takes to be a great, a great country. Oil is one of the natural resources uh, that we find in Nigeria. But the story of oil has not been all positive in Nigeria. So it's brought, it's brought both negative and positive impact on the nation. Without doubt, Nigeria has earned a great deal of money. 95% of Nigeria's foreign exchange earnings is from oil. The estimate of resources flowing into the country from oil. Nigeria currently produces about 2 million barrels of oil a day and at an average price of about $80 a day. So we're talking of something in the magnitude of 160 million US dollars uh, every day. So no wonder then that the World Bank has classified Nigeria as a lower middle income country. And we've got an average GDP per capita of about $1,100. So Nigeria is making good money you know, from oil. But how has this you know, reflected on the economy? The thing to note about oil is that once you put in the initial investment and exploration and a well development, oil continues to flow with little or no operating costs. Now, when the nation is at sleep, oil is flowing. When the nation is at work, oil is flowing. And therefore, nothing is taken seriously because in sp whether you do anything or not, your, the oil still keeps flowing. And that is the problem with Nigeria. With oil um, coming in so cheaply, um, the nation hasn't taken development in other spheres of life, in other sectors of the economy, so seriously. So in essence, what I'm saying here is that um, 
oil has bred dependency. Nigeria is dependent on oil, so almost you know, solely for its uh, national income. Agriculture that used to be very important in the past, that used to affect Nigeria's uh, foreign exchange in the past, has been completely neglected. And therefore, the nation has uh, you know, found itself depending almost absolute, uh, entirely on oil. Now, because of the nature of the deposit of the hydrocarbons in Nigeria, it is relatively cheap to produce oil. You know, and uh, I have it on, you know, from colleagues in the oil sector that it takes you know, less than $20 to produce uh, a barrel of oil. And this is sold for about $80. So with that high you know, I margin, there's a lot of money floating around in the economy uh, to the extent that one of the uh, former heads of state in the 70s actually said that the problem with Nigeria is not money, but how to spend it. You know, and uh, though that statement was made several years ago and in a different context, but it's still very true today. We find that Nigeria lacks the capacity to be able to turn around its economy, to be able to transform the economy using the, the resources from oil. And that is why it is lagging behind most other major oil producing nations. So what I'm saying in essence here is that in spite of oil, Nigeria still remains a, a poor country, relatively speaking. The other impact of oil that we find in Nigeria, greed and corruption. There is also massive environmental degradation and human misery of an unimaginable scale. You know, you even find pervasive poverty in the country. Nigeria is now almost synonymous with uh, corruption. Corruption is everywhere. It's becoming even more famous for corruption than its oil. Some of my colleagues went to uh, one of the old Russian uh, states uh, recently, and uh, when they sp spoke about you know, working in Nigeria, they said, welcome to the white Nigeria, because the nation is almost as corrupt, even if not more corrupt than Nigeria. I'll just use a few examples to underscore what I'm saying about corruption here. Because oil production requires huge investments, this means massive contracts and therefore very, very massive kickbacks. In 2009, for example, KBL, that's Kellogg, Brown and Roots, one of the uh, four companies in the joint venture that uh, built Nigeria's liquefied natural gas plant on Bonny Island, was found the sum of, uh, I just checked that number, about $400 million, you know, for paying bribes of about $180 million, you know, to secure a $6 billion contract, you know, for building Nigeria's liquefied natural gas plant. It's a massive corruption. And another US company, uh, Wilbros, which is an oil servicing company, also paid bribes to Nigerian officials of about $6 million, you know, to secure a natural gas pipeli uh, pipeline contract. And this is the subject of ongoing investigations now in Nigeria. And two ex-officials of Wilbros were actually jailed in February 2010 you know, because of this um, uh, uh, incident. One, the other thing you find as a result of corruption is that uh, it pays you know, to keep the, uh, the Nigerian uh, refineries out of production. Most of the time, the refineries are not working, or when they are working, they are working below their installed capacities. And why is this? When there is no production, refined products will have to be brought into the country. And that means, uh, you know, contracts, huge contracts, which pays, you know, dividends to the officials. Another thing to note is that during the uh, Iran-Iraq war, Nigeria made, you know, a lot of money from oil. And, um, about 20% of uh, the earnings at that period in the 80s and early 90s uh, actually to the tune of about $12.2 billion disappeared, you know, from the, which means that the top government officials were dipping their hands into the treasury, the uh, national treasury, and we find money disappearing, you know, because it's easy to make, you know, we don't create things of uh, serious value because 
whether you do anything or not. The technology is foreign. You know, we have uh, joint venture partners, assets in the place, and uh, oil keeps flowing. So money comes easy and it's wasted. So you find that corruption is everywhere. Now, talking about other things about environmental degradation, because of the regulatory environment, you find that uh, the laws are not being enforced. Some of the environmental activists have actually accused the oil companies in Nigeria of environmental racism because they don't conform to international standards. Because of this, we find severe environmental degradation going on in the Niger Delta, and the Niger Delta region, as we know, is a wetlands of global significance, which means um, very rare species of flora and fauna are being devastated every day in Nigeria. And then lastly, you know, talking about poverty, you find that Nigeria consistently underperforms amongst the oil producing countries. If you look at the Human Development Report, which is published by the UNDP every year, Nigeria in 2009 on the uh, Human Development Index ranking is 158 out of about 182 countries. If you look at other oil producing countries, like Libya, for example, in Africa, it's number 55. South Africa, which is non-oil producing, is number 129. So which means that in spite of oil, poverty is still you know, widespread in Nigeria. So I guess the central thing I'm putting on the table here is that uh, the government of Nigeria has failed you know, to utilize the resources from oil, the income from oil, to transform the economy and to position Nigeria on that path of long-term and sustainable development. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'd like to start by saying there's two normal starting places for this discussion. Firstly, Nigerian government is the problem. Secondly, you know, the, the oil companies are here to extract oil. That's what they try to do and we should leave them alone in terms of their environmental regulation, human rights regulation. If they didn't do it, someone else, someone else would. But I don't really feel that that takes us anywhere. I think the, the real discussion is not whether oil majors are, are the problem, but, but actually what part of the problem do they contribute to? What can they improve? You know, we, we sat in the West here and um, oil companies like Shell subscribe to principles. Could these principles be applied in places like Nigeria? They, they say they operate to global principles. Could you speak more into the microphone? Sorry. However, the, you know, it's oil companies operating practices that play a significant role in ensuring that key problems remain in Nigeria. Because let's face it, until recently, the Niger Delta crisis, Shell was a critical part of Nigerian economy, where a majority of oil was extracted by Shell, was passed along Shell pipelines, and was shipped from Shell oil terminals. This is a multi-billion dollar industry partnering with the Nigerian government. It's important to try and understand what has gone wrong with oil in Nigeria, what has gone wrong with this production, what has gone wrong with this wealth, like Dara was explaining in terms of corruption. But what I'd like to concentrate on is actually that um, Shell and other oil majors' attempts to get at this oil has resulted that best practice has been set aside from day-to-day -day pragmatism to actually operate in a difficult environment. We also asked, before I come back to that, and that's where I'm going to finish up, is that also to talk about whether production, is it good that production is happening? I think that actually this is a bit of a, a non-debate, as it were. The real issue is, how is this oil an accelerant or a balancing agent to the corruption that exists? And the corruption that maintains that the poverty in Nigeria remains while the, while the rich elite continues to get richer off the back of the oil wealth. Let's face it, Nigeria was corrupt in the 60s before oil always fails. The political elites were not delivering to the local population. So whether oil um, is the cause of this is, can be debated round and round. However, what, what cannot be debated is that this has created an, an economic growth that is damaging to the economic development and the stability of the country. This development of the economy has not only had an appalling impact on the lives of the people of the Niger Delta, but has also undermined the investments and operational security of the oil majors. We have seen this recently with Shell's announcement last weekend that they're going to be willing to sell $4 billion worth of assets in the Niger Delta. This really begins to make this link between other environmental practices, operating practices in Shell, undermining their ability to operate in the Delta in the longer term, 
and therefore is their, their continual existence increasingly tied to the local population and is the government the problem for, for everyone? I'd actually focus that the extraction of oil is not the problem. It's the manner in which it is extracted, the nature of the local relationships which determine how this extraction takes place and at what cost. The rent-seeking behaviour of political elites who want a piece of oil revenue can be disastrous. This is the case in the Niger Delta. But growth has still occurred. You know, you just, if you look at the economic indicators, Nigeria has a 5% growth. But this 5% growth has been recorded at a time where the health and education service has been largely reported as collapsing across the country. Is this growth and development? Is this real, really where the country wants to be going? It is thus wrong to focus on, on development and whether oil really links to development. And what we should be focusing on is how can the extraction of oil create the most stable environment for this to continue. And that obviously means that people from where the wealth has come from have got to benefit from that. So, so I'm going to focus now on how operating practices can contribute to a stable operating environment and economic development and not just economic growth for the country. The economic growth must improve education, healthcare and infrastructure. I'm sure you're all, you all aware that when Yara Dua, the last president of Nigeria, was sick before he died, he had to fly to Saudi Arabia to get, to get healthcare. This is another country where you know, people talk about political elites and corruption, but I think the fact that Nigeria doesn't even have the health centre available that you have in Saudi speaks volumes. How have Shell and other companies got to such a disastrous point in, in the Delta? Um, and, why, and how have these practices contributed to the conflict? I think we also have to look a little bit internally here. In the 90s, there was a lot of debate with the, henning, the hanging of Ken Sarawiwa and others, human rights issues around um, Shell's implicity in human rights abuses. And in response, oil companies across the globe adopted a mantra of corporate social responsibility, global standards. But these standards were not applied in the same way that the oil industry applies a lot of the rest of its investment. The oil industry invests uh, long-term cycles, 10, 20 years ahead. You know, you're going to invest billions of dollars in order to have a, and you're going to get that return over a long process. But corporate social responsibility, has incre and particularly in Nigeria, has been on a short-term model, trying to deal with day-to-day -day issues, firefighting, response. I would say that this crisis of positioning faced by Shell and other, other multinationals has actually resulted in a lot of the resentment and their failure to license, uh, social license to operate in the Niger Delta. Um, as the oil majors responded to this criticism in the West and adopting CSR policies, um, they attempted to deliver development. You know, schools, water, health centre were built and this, this resulted in the oil majors being seen almost as a quasi-government institutions. However, now, 15 years later, it's not surprising that they've left a legacy of failed development attempts across the regions, particularly in the Niger Delta. They are, after all, oil majors and not development agencies. But why did these attempts fail? I think this is the really interesting part of this conversation. And I think the answer is to be found, as, as Dara said, in the governance system. You know, the, the oil companies have decided to do corporate social responsibility, decided to build the school, but how do they go about doing that? And I think that's the, the critical link that oil majors need to look critically at as they continue to operate in, the, in Nigeria in the coming decade or, or more. Yes, they feed, they feed the corrupt patronage system from the top through the revenue payments, but the real contribution they make to the crisis of governance in the Niger Delta is to feed it from the bottom as well, with the contracts for development, for schools, and the way that the, the people that get these contracts is very much tied to the patronage system. So it's still the, the big man in the village, the person with the most, the most strength that, that takes what they can and fail to deliver, deliver the um, development that's, that's needed. Thus the projects are not, de not delivered. But who do the communities turn to? This, this creates a really bad reputation for, for Shell and other oil companies in the Delta. This, this creates resentment um, and further undermines the social license to operate. However, you know, is this just by, by default through lack of understanding? Or is it just as I, as I actually believe that it's, um, it's an acceptance to be part of the local system so that can, you can continue to operate day to day? I think if we look at the oil spills issue that's been in the debate recently, you know, yes, we can have the debate. There's been thousands of oil spills in the Niger Delta every year. But I think the real issue here and the real legacy issues in the Niger Delta that the oil majors need to look at is that, that the way they respond to this. How, how is this responded to? Often you will see a, a big man in an area getting a contract and oil just be turned upside down, flipped over, and that's, that's clean up. It's these, it's these practices which are, which are not acceptable. 
But this doesn't mean that this has to continue. And I think that the oil majors are beginning to recognize that this short-term operational practices around um, corporate social responsibility, response to environmental environmental practices are actually beginning to undermine their own ability to operate in the medium to long term in the Niger Delta. To, to put some suggestions for ideas out there, you know, they could adopt transparency and contracting, maybe even with a little text message to, to the people in the community saying that this contract has, has been delivered. That again would begin to challenge the governance patronage system that doesn't use any of the oil wealth to begin, begin to deliver. You might even be able to have ability where you have a public disclosure of oil spills within 24 hours, perhaps on a website or something in that, that nature. And therefore, this whole space between how the patronage networks work and the oil companies respond locally would begin to be, begin to be removed. It's through adopting these practices that I really think that the oil industry and the oil extraction in the Delta could be of benefit for the people in the Niger Delta. However, if this <coughs> fails to happen, as been the last case for the last 20 years, we're going to see more instability, more violence, um, and decreasing in not only the human rights abuse of the people in the Niger Delta, but the shareholding shareholders value of the oil majors that continue to choose to operate there. So when we talk about Shell in Nigeria now, um, it's worth remembering that that's uh, 6,000 uh, people, 90% of whom are Nigerian. Um, so one of the, the uh, preconceptions that certainly I had before I went there was that it was lots of expats and not many Nigerians. It's not. It's 90% it's Nigerian. Um, it's, it's also 55% owned by the government of Nigeria. So the government of Nigeria has a majority ownership of the entity itself. A very large proportion of foreign earnings are generated by this company, but it's also worth remembering that 95% of the revenue that the, the company makes after costs is returned to government in taxes and royalties. So the, the whole setup is very Nigerian, very focused on um, maintaining an international oil company, bringing in the, uh, the skills and technology into a country like Nigeria. Since 1957, there have been many, many attempts by people inside the shell companies in Nigeria, there are about five of them, but one big one, to bring benefits to Nigeria. People have looked around the country and said, there are poor people, there are millions of poor people, I think one of the, the, the only things I'd add to the sketch that, uh, that Dara gave you about Nigeria is that it's an awfully big country. It's 160-odd million people. So that, that you need to generate a lot of wealth for that to, to, to be distributed. And there are a lot of people in Shell who have taken Nigeria to, to their hearts, who've loved being there, and have really wanted to do good things in terms of schools, hospitals, and, and help to the place. Some of that hasn't worked, as, as Joe has said. Some of the actions which were driven by goodwill have actually replaced government or allowed government to step away from their responsibilities. Uh, so what has Shell in Nigeria been? It has been a very big company. It is the prime job in Nigeria. If you can get a job in, in SBDC, you're, you're thrilled. Um, it, is a, it is the face of oil. So um, Exxon, Chevron, uh, and the other companies are regarded by many in Nigeria as um, little, little operating units of Shell. And people say, yes, but it's, it's all Shell. W the stuff we've tried, as I said, some of it hasn't worked. I think more interesting in a way than what hasn't worked, because there's an examples of failed development everywhere in the third world. More interesting in a way is the question, some of the stuff we've tried has worked. Why, why did it work? What were the elements of some of the development initiatives that, that the company has taken? And we're currently spending 60 or so million dollars a year on development support in the Delta, and an additional 150 million or so is extracted from us to go to the uh, Niger Delta Development Commission. Some of that stuff works. The really interesting part of that story for me is what works in that. Why does it work? Why is it that uh, the rain gathering project, water use, reuse project works? Is it, is it to do with the transparency? Is it to do with the governance? Is it to do with the fact that perhaps some of our biodiversity projects, which are relatively successful, 
aren't in the delta, the core delta. They're a little bit further away where the conflicts created by all this uh, oil money are not as extreme. And learning from those is at least, if not more important, than learning from what hasn't worked. What next, though? You've, you've, you've had extremely clear pictures painted for you of what's going on in the country and how difficult it is as a place to work. What we want to do is summarized in a, in a few headlines, and I'll try and give some examples now and in response to questions if you want to pursue this. We see a, uh, a need to engage. It's very easy as an oil company staffed by very technical people who see the world in very simple language. If you drill a hole in the ground, oil comes out, you put it in a pipe, you sell it. And the world isn't nearly that simple. Um, in Nigeria, we have had Sorry, I'm going to have to refer to the bits of paper. But in, in 2008 and 9, between 2008 and 9, 62 employees were kidnapped and, th and three were killed. Now, th there is a huge focus on safety in Shell, such, such an extent that in Shell Centre in London, that if you don't hold the handrail, uh, people point this out to you. If you wore this in Shell, you would be out of compliance with the health and safety rules in Shell because it doesn't have a snap thing on it. Yeah? There is an obsession about safety in Shell. The idea that three people were killed and that, that, that people were not returning to their families after a day at work is not considered normal in Shell. It's not something that we feel comfortable with. And so that operating environment is extremely difficult. But one of the things that we have done as a result is to go into our shells, is to, under criticism and under attack, is to draw up the fences, uh, draw up the drawbridges, and not engage, and therefore not understand enough about the situation we're in, the situations we might be causing, the conflict that we're in the midst of. So the first thing that we identify, something we want to do, is to engage. The second piece is we do see that change is needed. I don't think it's surprising if you think about it that I would say that an oil spill is a really, really bad thing. A really bad thing in the Delta. It's a really bad thing everywhere. And we don't want them. There are too many in the Delta. We don't think that gas flares are good. Gas is a, a precious resource with energy potential and greenhouse potential. Flares are not exactly a good thing. So we do see the need to change. In the context we're in, it's really hard to see what that consists of, which is why we need to engage and understand and make that change appropriate. So we want to engage, we want to change. We really have got to get to grips with reducing the number of oil spills and gas flares. I don't think you'd be surprised, I think you'd be very surprised if I stood here and defended any of that. There's a lot of very hard thinking that needs to happen about how you can do that at a time now, this year, where we have made some progress in reducing oil spills, reducing flares, in the, because of the amnesty. I'm sure people will want to follow that up, and I'll pick up some numbers in response to, to that to demonstrate. But two last points very quickly. We also see that the lack of civil society strength, particularly in the Delta, is a huge burden on development, and we want to play our part in contributing uh, to civil society and working in partnership to grow civil society. We do need to contribute our um, award-winning HIV programs. We do need to continue to support our 27 hospitals that we support in the Delta, 17,000 people in schools. But that, I'm, not, I'm not saying I'm raising those numbers until right at the end, because the important piece is about how we operate into the future. Thank you. The common theme through this panel today has been two entities, Nigeria on the one hand, and Shell, the corporation on the other. Now, Nigeria is a country. The most important stakeholders are its citizens. On the other hand, Shell is a corporation. Its most important stakeholders are its shareholders. Now, one of those entities has done a magnificent job of returning value to its stakeholders, and it's not the Nigerian state. The Nigerian state, there was an audit in uh, in the, Obasanjo's, the General Obasanjo's first term in office, he conducted an audit of all receipts since independence. And this audit found that $400 billion 
was missing, an amount of $400, $400 billion was missing or had been mismanaged. Now today, Shell's market capitalization is less than $190 billion. So in effect, the Nigerian state has wasted two times what Shell as a corporation is worth today. I think it's a misplaced focus to even talk about Shell in a larger, in a large sense. Of course, Shell has been, Shell is guilty of egregious, I mean, just stupidity, I think, because of the way that they've engaged with the local population, because of the way that they've abrogated responsibility. It's an important company in Nigeria. But I think that the blame lies squarely on the Nigerian state. For instance, the Nigerian state deals with Shell as through NMPC as a regulator, a business partner, an investor, and a policymaker. That confusion of that confusion of, of, of roles is a function, I think, of the general dysfunction that attends the Nigerian state today. Now the question to me is not so much how did we get here, but how do we transform Nigeria and other countries like this in Africa? And what do we replace them with? And maybe even another question is talk of transformation, transforming societies that are 50 years or 60 years off, far gone. Maybe talk of transforming them is, is idealistic, is naive. Maybe these countries are too far gone, maybe too far steeped in their habits of corruption to change. I think those are the relevant questions. Um, I think that it's a canard to blame Shell for a lot of the problems that we find in Nigeria. I think it's a, it's, it's, it's misplaced, it's a misplaced focus. But I do think that Shell has issues that it needs to answer for. For instance, Barnaby mentioned the gas flaring. Over $2 billion worth of gas is flared every year. Over $2 billion. That's not only the money foregone, the income foregone, but the industries that could have been sparked that could have been fueled by that gas. The power crisis in Nigeria, for instance, that gas could have been harnessed to drive the development of the power sector. Every year, that gas is just frittered away into the, into, in, 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 into the atmosphere. And so, in conclusion, I'll go back to the three things that I brought up. How do we change the Nigerian state? What do we replace it with? A politician in Nigeria will say that I'm not to blame for the corruption. Like, like the song uh, Tupac, Tupac says, I was born in this world, I didn't make it. That's going to be the mantra of any politician in Nigeria. I, I, I inherited the system. I did not make it. So I think it's also even, I've come to the point where I think it's also even naive to look at public officials because they find themselves in almost a, they, 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 as quickly as they are to say it, they're as much victims of the system as they are villains of it. How do we change the system? It's the system that needs to be changed, not so much the people, not so much the public officials, but the system of governance in Nigeria. We have electoral reform going on now, but electoral reform is just a mechanism. The feeder system of, elect of governments are the political parties. How do we change the political parties? How do we segregate them into different uh, entities, different organizations that will deliver services to people when they're elected, that will deliver, that will protect the rights of people, of citizens of Nigeria. That are, those, I think, are the substantive questions that need to be addressed, especially in this, in this, in this battle of ideas, in this place of ideas. Thank you very much. Okay, so I'm going to kick off with maybe one or two questions and then we'll throw out to the audience. I mean, this is for all four of you. In different ways, you all seem to accept that Shell, as it makes so much wealth in Nigeria, um, needs to take some kind of responsibility for the impact of its development in Nigeria. And um, you all seem to agree with that. But I wonder whether that doesn't raise some questions about democracy and sovereignty. I mean, Dippo, you made the point that you put your emphasis on Nigeria as the problem here, not Shell. And you talked about how we can resolve the situation. But if we if Shell takes more and more responsibility and becomes, as somebody said here, a quasi-government, I mean, Shell is not a democracy. Shell is a, a company. No matter how failed the Nigerian political system is, there's still a possibility of some accountability. So my question is, if we, if we see Shell as being the institution to resolve some of these problems, doesn't that raise some broader democratic questions about, about Nigeria? 
I absolutely I agree. I think it I think it would be a it would be a frightening prospect to look to Shell or to expect Shell to to solve Nigeria's problems. It's 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 not it's SPDC, it's arm in Nigeria is a Nigerian company, but it's uh, it's also tucked under the umbrella of Shell in the Netherlands. And I think that it, 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 it removes the responsibility of Nigerians as citizens and as, as, as full-fledged citizens and human beings to decide the course of their own destinies. I think it's an important, it's an important, it's a fundamental human responsibility. So I think it would be a frightening prospect to have that Nigerian responsibility replaced by even the best of interests from Shell. So Barnaby, where do you see Shell's responsibility ending and starting? Because in your talk, you seem to be, if you like, going quite a long way now to say that Shell's made other mistakes in the past, but you seem to be indicating that Shell is going to take more and more responsibility for its activities in Nigeria in terms of outside just making profits. I mean, where do you see Shell's responsibility ending? So, so I think there are two parts to the question. Um, the first is that no one voted for us. Um, absolutely, and, and um, if we're not a very good development agency, we'd be a really useless government. <laughs> That's not how we're set up. Um, but the second piece is that, uh, and this applies everywhere, not just in Nigeria, um, the way in which, and, and this is at a much, much more grassroots level, uh, the way in which we engage with our neighbours, the way in which we work on, in, in Britain, local councils, in, in Louisiana, in the local parish, and the way in which we um, work with the local systems to get things done can make a difference. So I'm, I'm absolutely not saying that Shell should take some highfalutin uh, way forward about uh, promoting democracy and transparency. What I'm saying is that we should tra treat our neighbours with respect um, and create, help create spaces for those conversations which aren't about um, is it your fault or is it our fault, but are about we're in this situation together, how do we plan from here forward? And not, I don't mean plan for Nigeria, I don't mean plan for the Delta, I don't even mean for one state, I mean for that village. How do we engage in such a way that uh, that one place has a direction and even by asking that question, um, we can help stimulate a more positive response that's more about taking responsibility. So, so I'd also, al almost answer the question in two halves. One is, no one voted for us and, and they shouldn't. Um, and, but at a grassroots, everyday, respect for your neighbor level, you can create a conversation which is more helpful than not. And that's exactly the same as we do in the US or the UK or, or Holland. And we just participate. I completely agree with Dippo in terms of, you know, it's not Shell's responsibility to be the government or to interfere in any way in government reforms. However, I disagree with Barnaby in terms of, you know, not democracy and transparency. I think that the way that you engage local communities, that, that grassroots level, needs to be wider than white because of the, the history of where Shell and others now find, other oil companies now find. This is not just a Shell issue, it's all oil companies in the, in the Delta. You know, it's the way that, okay, you've chosen to position yourself here, you're going to deliver this development intervention or, you know, you're going to have an MOU and you're going to give uh, three million to this, this group of communities to spend on something. But it's actually, once that money gets spent, can you um, initiate best practice into the way that you actually work so that the, the transparency occurs at that level, the accountability is there, the respect for the local communities. Why, who is it to say that because they're in that, that local community they're not going to understand that someone's been given a contract or that sort of that arrogance, that, that space above. It, it, I, you know, when I'm in the Delta, it's really exciting to sit down and discuss people need to take ownership of their own, their own development. And actually by doing those things and setting best practices, when the local government comes about to deliver a school, a health project or something, the community will be asking for the same standards that the Shell's applied in the government response. And it's actually that government response which Shell has nothing to do which is key, but if Shell follows practices that, and other oil companies that show best, best way of doing things, then we're, then we're on to something. What I'd like to, to see Shell do in Nigeria is to apply the same standards, you know, operating standards that uh, it, it's applied, you know, in other uh, parts of the world. And that is, for me, is crucial, a crucial part of respect for neighbors. You know, if we operate you know, uh, different standards in Nigeria because the government is not responsible, then because we can get away with, with, with anything, I think that, for me, is not a respect for, a respect for neighbors. And just to conclude that 
Nigeria's problems are best solved by the Nigerian government. In the past, uh, up until the you know, mid-80s, we had a responsible government in Nigeria. There was income from oil, and that was applied you know, towards developing the nation. Nigeria was up there amongst the Committee of Nations, but from mid-80s, you know, from the, the, the period of structural adjustment program, you know, when uh, corruption started creeping into the nation, when it became possible to have uh, uh, sums in the budget for projects that are not executed, that is when Nigeria started business. And until we come back to that point of you know, responsible government in Nigeria, then we're not going to go anywhere. Thank you. Apart from that, the last little bit that you touched on there, the whole panel seemed to be assuming that um, you know, development is, would occur naturally if it wasn't for the corrupt Nigerian state, and that you know, um, all you had to do was just sort of end corruption, and the oil revenues would sort of generate um, development. I didn't hear any discussion of economic policy. I didn't hear any discussion of economics. You know, what is the Nigerian economy? I don't know. I'm no, none the wiser from listening to that, to that discussion. Um, Aberdeen is rich due to the fact that in the 70s, um, Aberdeen councillors actually um, implemented and insisted on some policies that oil companies adhere to, which at the time, the oil companies said that they were going to leave North Sea Oil, that they were going to bankrupt, um, and the British government was worried they were going to be bankrupted because of it. Now, what I would be interested in is whether um, people within Nigeria, whether it's the governments, whether it's local people, are actually insisting on the right policies and what those policies should be to make sure that the economic benefits actually come to the local people of Nigeria. I think there are two clear groups who benefit from the current situation. There's the Nigerian government and their shell and they're in it together. They prop each other up, they support each other and I really going back to the, the last presenter who said there needs to be a different system, I think it's very naive to think that we can continue to see these peop the people of Nigeria being robbed and plundered and think that, th that throwing them crumbs of development aid is going to do anything. I think there will be a very tough day of reckoning and I hope the people responsible will bear in mind their responsibility. The title of this seminar was um, about Africa and oil. So I wanted to just broaden out the discussion a little bit because there are obviously a number of other African countries that are discovering, have discovered oil, and are about to be in a really similar situation. And the question is, okay, how can they not necessarily, are there any particular lessons that we can learn from the Nigerian experience as to how to do this better? And there's two examples which I want to put to the panel. Um, or just two ideas that I want to put to the panel and understand what your reactions are. First, it's should they actually keep the oil under the ground? Um, Ecuador is um, asking Western governments to pay them to, put, to keep their oil under the ground. Is that a solution? And is it actually economically um, kind of sensible? The other suggestion is um, to have the oil money put into a separate account in treasuries so that they can be monitored um, and understood uh, separately. That's, I think, a suggestion from Paul Collier. What are your reactions to those? There are an awful lot of people in this country and many others who, if they go to the filling station and they don't see petrol for sale at a price they are prepared to pay, get really cross. Yeah? It, it is unacceptable for millions of people, uh, you know, my family included, if we go to the gas station, there's no gas in it. So that the dilemma that we're caught in is that um, the, the, the effects of oil development might be felt differently in the place where you're burning it. So we all get the benefit for driving to work or driving to the cinema or whatever it is, um, while the disbenefits might go somewhere else. So. I think that we, we have to do, we have to recognize that we are, I think even jo um, George Bush admitted we are addicted to this oil. So, so we have to, that's the context we're in. So I don't think that the Ecuadorians have got a hope because someone's always going to pay more 
for their, for their oil. And if they're not going to get it, well, we'll go to Canada and get the oil sands. And if they're not going to do it, we'll go to Saudi Arabia. And if they're not going to, I mean, there's, there's a lot of it around. So the, the, the sort of depressing point is that we're all running these lights off hydrocarbons. We're all going to get in a car or a train that runs on hydrocarbons. And we need this stuff. So that's the sort of context that, that the economics um, drives off. As, as to the, um, some of the other questions about the wider economic policy and so on, um, I'm not best qualified to answer. I think that there are um, some very interesting things going on in Nigeria in terms of economic policy, economic uh, change over the last uh, decade. In particular, the, the things around um, mobile phones and the social consequences of mobile phones. So I'll maybe leave others to, to pick that up, but it, it is an extraordinarily different situation where people are able to find the price of things with one phone call or to bank over, over the phone. Um, and as for, for Aberdeen and, and the way in which you try and um, make some of the money sticky and stick where it comes from, um, lots of people have tried this in lots of different places and some works better than others. Um, there is some information exchange between some of the Alaskan uh, native owned companies and the current policy uh, debate in Nigeria about how to set up regional corporations. Yeah, I think that the, 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 the point is this context we're in where we're addicted to this cheap uh, form of energy or relatively cheap form of, form of energy and the, the, the economics behind that are brutally simple, um, which is, you know, that's where we are at the moment. Now changing that, um, that's the, from, from a climate change perspective, and, and I think that you, you'll have seen some of what Shell has said about climate change, we're in for a rough ride. Um, it's not going to be simple, either in terms of weaning ourselves off these high carbon uh, fuels or, you know, and creating a low carbon future. That's going to be a long, long process. But the, the effects of climate change, uh, speaking as someone who, who has studied the, the biological effects, of the ecological effects of climate change, it's here. So, so we're, in, we're in a really tough place on that one. I think, um, for me, if it's going to be more beneficial to keep the oil in the ground without production for Nigeria, I think that's the route to go. You know, uh, because in Nigeria, we've come to that stage whereby oil is being seen more as a burden, something that, uh, that has contributed uh, positively. Uh, with regards to lessons to be learned in the new African countries uh, where oil has just been found, I think, first and foremost, uh, they have to define their business model. How is oil, starting with ownership, in Nigeria, the oil resource is owned by the national government and not the community where it's found. It's not owned by the state government where it is found, and it is the people that live next to oil installations that are impacted negatively, yet they don't have any direct benefits. All the resources go to the national government, it goes into, into the national treasury and disappears from there with little or nothing coming to the communities. Then again, the way they're going to operate, you know, the oil production, where you find the regulator being a major player in the business itself, itself it brings nothing but confusion. So Nigerian state had not been able to regulate the activities of the oil companies because it is a major player in the business and the largest shareholder in the joint ventures. So I think these are some of the, the lessons to be learned you know, from Nigeria. Going back to the issue of economic policy, I think we say in Nigeria that uh, the problem is not with the plans, you know, economic development plans, we have them from the fourth development plan to the fifth national plan to the rolling plans. They are all there, nice blueprints. The problem is with the implementation because there is a, uh, a lack of, uh, you know, uh, willingness, the, the, the will, the political will to put those plans into action is the primary problem. Uh, there's no doubt that there is some issues around you know, capacity in economic planning, you know, uh, public sector man management, but that is not the, the central issue. The central issue is putting those uh, plans into action, and this is primarily arising from the fact that uh, Nigeria, the way it's, it is now, it's, you cannot really say it is a state, because there's no common you know, development agenda amongst the uh, various constituent parts of Nigeria. Uh, we operate federal republic, you know, it's a, it's a federal system, but you find that uh, there is a huge disconnect between the central government and the state and the local government. We have uh, 
different players at these different levels, and we're not working towards a common goal. And that's why you find that uh, the situation in the past, in the 60s, the, the First Republic, for, for example, um, that brought so much development to Nigeria, because at that time, the <laughs> different regions were free to have their plans, implement them, and there's a healthy rivalry between these different parts of Nigeria, and you know, it led to growth and development. You know, what we find now is that because every part of Nigeria, the, the country has now been split into 36 states from the original three or four regions that, that, that we started with in the 60s. And none of these uh, states, oh, except one or two of them, is actually economically viable. So they're all dependent on the national, you know, on the national government. So every month, the government at the lower levels are waiting for allocations from the federal government. And until that comes, nothing happens in those states. And they're not working to generate any income you know, by, uh, by themselves. So one is not surprised, we are surprised, therefore, that tax collection it's low because people are not willing to pay taxes because the services are just not there. You know? So that is the situation. And unless we begin to retrace our steps, unless we begin to, to, to look at how we want Nigeria to be in the next five or 10 years and begin to work towards that as a nation, then nothing is going to change. But we, but we did say that if we are able to utilize the income from oil you know, to build a new nation, you know, then Nigeria will be able to move and launch itself on the path of a sustainable. Uh, the, I think those were <coughs> excellent questions. The first one uh, about economic policy. I think it's very, very true. What is lost in the issue of villains in Shell, in this company and that company, is the fact that without all these issues, do, does Nigeria and do African countries have a clear way forward economically? Now, we've, we've struggled from pillar to post with the Washington consensus, the, from the Bretton Woods institutions and into the Asian model, but we have not, as a society, as, an, as Africans, a, a, a designed a, an economic policy that's based on our social values and our societies, our cultures, which is, I think is fundamental for any society in the world. You have to get it right to fit your society first before you can, before you can thrive with any economic, uh, with any economic policy. And, and then also the issue about leaving the oil in the ground, I think that I under, while I understand the reasons and the frustrations that will lead to that, I think it's a tremendous mistake. I think oil is not a curse. The curse and burden and uh, blessing argument, I think, is misplaced. Oil is an incredible opportunity. It's, 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 an, op it's an opportunity to, 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 to spend money on infrastructure, to spend money on citizens, to provide health care, education. It's, it's an incredible opportunity. And, the to leaving it in the ground, if it was left in the ground, the money that was came out of the ground today in Nigeria, the two million barrels, that's lost forever. I, and also, we have to remember that technology is moving faster pace and solutions are being thought up. And if you leave it in the ground today, you might have to leave it in the ground forever. And, uh, and lastly, I just want to say that Norway is a very good example for me. Uh, Norway has in its sovereign wealth fund, to talk about the second point you made, $600 billion. That sovereign wealth fund, those two sovereign wealth funds, control 1% of all the equities in the world. They ex they, the oil comes out of, in, in, in Norway, ultra deep water. It costs $70 for every barrel, to extract every barrel of oil in, in Norway. It costs $5 in Nigeria. And yet, with this scarcity of, of, of with, with this scarcity, they have managed to build six hundred billion dollars, and with Nigeria has managed to, to lose four hundred. This sovereign wealth fund, the Norwegian one, was started fifteen years ago, just fifteen years ago. Nigeria's sovereign wealth fund is now being started with a paltry, relatively paltry, one billion dollars. It's I'll, 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 okay. Thanks yeah. so much. Well, I am actually Norwegian, and I'm happy to hear that that was used as an example. Uh, I think that uh, it's kind of unfair to compare, though, sort of Norway with, with Nigeria. It's a much larger country, much more complex. Uh, but I had a couple of issues that I think is very vital. I think one 
of course, we have to let Nigeria decide upon their own future. I think that's vital. I would like to see Norwegians in the 70s being dictated what to do with their oil revenues, uh, and they would strongly oppose any other opinions than the Norwegian opinions. Secondly, I think that Shell could do a lot more. I think that uh, it's one area that you always uh, sort of come back to discussing here, and that's the uh, area of corruption. And, and I think that, uh, yeah, I mean, in all the procurement practices you have, I'm sure you have a lot of internal process and all these things, but why don't Shell stand up in the middle of the oil industry saying that we want zero tolerance for any kind of corruption and please be with us, all oil companies, supply industry in, in Nigeria. I think that would actually be a very interesting uh, example. And, uh, and thirdly, I think that we are all to blame in a way, in the sense that I think that the only thing we'd like to buy from Africa, and that's more in general, is actually oil, gold, gold and diamonds. So maybe we should think about our own protectionism a little bit. I'd like to know if anyone else on the panel was alarmed when um, our friend from Shell said that they want to get into the business of strengthening civil society and opening those spaces. At the same time that they're saying they actually are not have any way of controlling the government, the government is their business partner, and I, I'm not sure what business model you're using when you let your business partner be negligent in the way that the, the Nigerian government is. I don't think I'm saying anything new. It's just that when, when you talk about the solutions that you've tried, it's rainwater harvesting, schools, hospitals, it's, it's not the solutions that everyone else in the room is saying are necessary, which are changes in governance. And I don't think we're having a real battle of ideas as long as we keep talking about development projects instead of, instead of real accountability. What are the things that you've tried that lead to transparency and accountability of the Nigerian government? Specifically, what approaches? Um, hi, uh, we're all familiar with the um, uh, concept of sustainable development. Um, I was just wondering the thoughts of the panel whether uh, the, co uh, the framework, sustainable framework, can be applied to the corruption taking place in Nigeria. Um, is this kind of uh, corruption sustainable? Um, is it viable, as the first speaker said, for 80% of the country's wealth to be enjoyed by 1% of the population? Um, is, will it uh, escalate into a critical mass, kind of a, a point whereby um, irreparable damage will be done to the fabric of Nigerian civil society? In ancient Athens, they found a, a, a rich mine of silver uh, in Lorien, and they had a debate in civil society what to do with it. Um, and they said, decided to build a fleet, defeat the Persians, and went on to uh, found democracy and build the Parthenon. So they uh, got a lot of benefit for getting things out of the ground. As it happens, they used slaves uh, to do so, and there were horrible conditions in those mines, and people died. But at least they had a long-term strategic, strategic vision and uh, wanted to uh, make take things out of the ground, produce new things, and create a better society. So clearly, if you're in Nigeria, you do have to have a debate within civil society about what to do with that natural wealth, and how to distribute it, and what Nigeria should do. That's a debate that has to happen within Nigeria. Over here in the West, there's a different problem, that we seem to be hostile to the idea of economic growth per se. That, as is said here, they must be made accountable. We can look into their accounts, stop them doing what we don't like. In fact, it might be better just to leave it there in the first place and do nothing. What would Nigeria do then? Presumably return to subsistence farming. That would be sustainable, but it would be a rubbish life. I think we need to be able to see both sides of the problem and see that hostility here uh, in the West to economic growth per se is, in fact, the really short-termist thinking, not that of Shell of making a profit, but our really short-termist thinking is to say, let's not make the best out of the world that we can. Uh, just a quick question. Stand up, mate. Uh, given the growing prevalence of China in the African extractors industry, what do you think China's role is, both in the African oil industry and the Nigerian oil industry? Thank you. There you go. Okay, I think I'm going to start on this, um, join a couple of the points together. First, this viability thing. Is this current system and uh, the 80% going to the 1% viable? Um, I think simply it's not. And I think that the... The rise of militancy and, and conflict in the Delta is in part you know, an example of that. There's, there's other criminality bits, but if you're actually to talk about the, the politics that has created the space for violence to be used um, to, to address the underlying issues that result from this 80% going to 1% is, is serious for everyone. And I think that um, looking, looking for um, accountability and transparency mechanisms within that current system is a really, really important way to go. And I think there I want to touch on how important this is to all of us as well in this room, you know, the, the oil pump issue. 
Um, the British government has got a policy. We want 20% of oil and gas from West Africa within the next 10 years. That basically means the Niger Delta. Um, you know, some from Angola, but because of relationships with China, it's not going to really happen. It basically means the Niger Delta. And if we want to be able to get that oil pump out, actually, this, the system of uh, patronage politics and corruption in Nigeria um, is going to impact on our oil price here. That, that's absolutely clear. And the British government continued sort of response of, oh, it's emerging democracy, it needs to take time. No, they're supporting that 1% to keep the 99% the living, living in poverty. Um, what the oil companies also need to recognise, though, is that they continue to support that 1%. That's going to be their ability to operate that's going to get really nailed at the local level. Uh, the government doesn't exist in the Delta, so what are people going to attack? It's going to be the oil installations, um, whether that's their fault or not. Um, the couple of other... So, therefore, um, the zero tolerance point, I think, is absolutely key. Beginning to set those precedents to show that... Um, even if your money go, you, you generate through oil production goes to the, the government, you actually try and do the best thing for that, for that population. So I think that's, that's central. Supporting civil society, I think that, that would be very dangerous um, if oil companies continue to or sort of you know, um, pay for a civil society to, to do, their dirty work, do their dirty work for them. But the reality is, where's the money going to come from? SDN doesn't take money from, from oil industry and will continue not to. But with current funding realities, it is, it is difficult. You know, that's, that's, um, that's reality. You know, uh, the retraction of economies here is reducing the, the space for people to, to paying out elsewhere. That's just, that's just where we're at. I, I, actually, I'll, I know Joe very well. He's a very good friend. And his company, his organization does a lot of incredible work in, in, uh, in Nigeria, in the Delta. But I'll slightly disagree with what he said. I absolutely think that the present system is very, very viable. It's absolutely viable. It will continue this way for 100 years unless something is done about it. The, this Newton's first law of motion, I'll translate into this, says that everybody continues in a state of rest or uniform motion unless compelled to do otherwise. This system will remain for 1,000 years unless it is forced or brought to change. I'm not talking about violent force. I'm talking about molded. I'm talking about persuaded to change. It's absolutely viable. I think we should not undervalue the potentials uh, that are um, around the uh, idea of uh, you know, keeping the oil in the ground, not perpetually, but for a while. We are saying that the current system is broken. It's not working for the benefit of the people. Uh, is it then out of place to say, OK, for the next two, three, or five years, we want to stop you know, oil production, get our house in order, get ourselves organized before we resume. It is an idea that's already been canvassed by the Niger Delta youths, and it's something that we might have to be addressing as a nation very, very seriously in the near future. Uh, that's one point. Um, the issue about oil companies supporting um, civil society, I know that that's something that will be strange in the West. But the reality of the Niger Delta is such that we don't have these organizations in place. They are weak, you know, disorganized, and most often they do not have the resources to operate. You know, if we're saying that the oil companies are a major part of the problem, isn't it also right for them to be a part of the solution? And the way by which they can be a part of the solution is by supporting the society organizations to be able to operate and achieve their, you know, their mission. We have said that government is responsible. Government is not doing very much. You know? So if Shell, for example, is taking oil from Nigeria and is generating a lot of value for its um, shareholders, is it then wrong if Shell wants to put some money back into the Delta you know, for the benefit of the people? But Shell is an oil company. It's not a development organization. It does not do development. So if you can walk through intermediary organizations you know, that are strong, credible, and viable, I don't think uh, that idea should, allow, uh, should alarm anyone. In terms of transparency, the, quite a lot of effort has been put into the Extractive Industry Transparency Initiative and the Nigerian equivalent of it, and a lot of that effort has come from Shell. Um, we also have uh, put a lot of effort into the voluntary principles on security and human rights. 
We've also worked with donors in Nigeria, some more successfully than others. And as I said earlier, we've got these new approaches to, to development. And all of those initiatives are the sort of things I think come under the heading of contribution to, to civil society, not, ne not necessarily handing out money, which is probably the worst possible contribution one can make. Two final points. The, f the first one is that we are backing this up by trying to be transparent in our own right. We are putting stuff on the internet that hasn't been there before, like environmental impact assessments. Um, and the final point is that, and this is probably the most important for me personally, which is that we've heard a lot this afternoon about the problems and the possible fixes. Um, Shell will still be in Nigeria. I'm going to still be part of trying to make those fixes. If anyone's got any good ideas, come with us, because it's not an easy place to be. But don't just sit there in London and think, oh, it's a bit tricky, and I'll go to the gas station and fill up my car. Get out to the Nigerian Delta. Okay, if you want a job with Shell, you know where to go. Thank the speakers, please.